and the project would be at the end of semester. One of you could choose, I uh, think, brain boundaries or precipitates uh, and can uh, refer to the paper. Okay, guys. I think this is a syllabus here. Uh, it is divided into four classes, four chapters. One is uh, your basic electron microscope operation that we are covering now. In the next chapter, we will move to diffraction patterns. In the following chapters, we will become more specific about different features like bubbles, precipitates and loops. And in the final chapter, we will do a little bit of machine learning. Now, what are the basic properties of electrons? So, we know it's a microscope, right? Any microscope, whether it's a, a light microscope or an electron microscope, what is the common thing there? What do you understand by microscope in general? You're looking closely at matter. Right. Can any one of you summarize the technique? Like, what is happening? Light is coming. It's uh, there's an object. There are lenses, and finally you get an image. Any physical method? Uh, that you can tell me like what is happening physically. Well, in TM, I, I mean, I guess the, uh, you, using a, a thin enough sample that you know, the electrons pass through what you're examining and then, uh, you know, discerning how those interactions appear in the image is, reveals what structure is there. Right. So basically, electrons are interacting with matter, right? In a light microscope, light is interacting with the matter. And I can also use neutron, I can use electron, or I can also use, you know, um, light as you say. Maybe I can use infrared microscope. So I need to have a source that interacts with my material. And finally, I can image it. So, an electron versus light, what is the difference? Charge. Charge, well done. What else? Mass. Mass as well. Mass, what else? Wavelength. Wavelength, okay. Have you heard about this thing? If you have high energy, you will have a shorter wavelength. What principle is that? It's ACO number. Which de Broglie's? Yeah. Yeah? So what happens is if you have a high energy, you will have short wave. And you can see more deeper into matter. Yeah. You can dissolve it more. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So versus neutron, electron, or light, what I use in which case? Whenever we have, we need a low magnification, I can do light because there is certain energy that light can have. For a higher energy stuff, or for place where I need a resolution in nanometers or picometers, I will go and use and electrons. Now, what is the general electron energy that we use? 200 kV. 200 or so. 200 kV. Generally, all the microscopes that we have here in Oak Ridge National Lab and at UT, they all go from 100 kV to 300 kV. That's a common range. Now, in these microscopes, what is, when you have a lower energy of electrons versus higher energy of electrons, how is it changing? In the high energy, some relativistic. Character. So the 
relativistic behavior is associated with a higher energy of electrons, right? Also, it is said that in biological samples, we use 60 kV microscope. Why? Any guesses? Versus our material science, where we are actually examining iron, you know, silicon carbide, or some of your... Would you be producing for radicals if the energy was too high? Yes. There is something that is known as damage created by electrons while you examine it. So, depending upon the field we have, we can choose this variety of energy. Also, for a higher energy microscope, you have one million electron volt microscopes. That is 1000 kV. 1000 kV would mean we have 200 kV, 300 kV, and just we go on number, we 1000 kV. That means something like six times more than what we have in, in UT. They are also available. They are big, big tower. And they are available at a, you know, facilities where they are really going sub-atom level. What is the resolution that we can get with the microscopes that we have at UT? Any idea? I'm cheating this time because Engel talked about it earlier in this <laughs> conversation with her. <laughs> it's 0.19. That would be the best bet. And when you see a 0.1 nanometer thing, you only see black and gray small atoms that are very, you know, that if not image is not taken properly, it's just an image, right? Right. So coming to the point, uh, we will uh, talk about basic properties of electrons. And I will talk about wave-particle duality. An electron is both particle and a wave. Depending upon what we are doing, we, try, we tend to choose the behavior. For electron diffractions, we use something called a wave phenomena. Now, anyone has to define me what is diffraction? What is interference? Before we begin, this diffraction term would keep on annoying you the entire class. <laughs> Interference between scattering from multiple different particles at the same time. Okay. Okay. Uh, interference. Like wave or constructive or destructive interference with waves. Right. And what is photoelectric phenomena? What's that? What can came and electron like that? Electrons don't touch. the 
what is this pattern here? There would be a bright spot in the center and there would be diffracted spots. So it's like, you know, your crystal was like this and you put a light on it. If it's a zone axis where, you know, multiple planes, they meet, it would give you, you know, a zone axis here, a signature of the exact zone where it is, your crystal is, right? And once you have this kind of pattern, the central spot is the brightest spot. Why? Because it consists of the main light that is coming here. Whereas these spots, they are coming from the diffraction from these planes, mm -hmm. right? So right now I'm drawing a very simplistic view, mm -hmm. but there is something more, more intense happening. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, planes like this, this, you know, in, in between, this, this, which are giving you the spots. I will come on the crystallography and will tell you. This is just to give you an overview. Right? So, this kind of pattern we would be focusing a lot on. What are these patterns? Just a bright spot patterns. Each spot means something. Central spot is a bright spot. Untransmitted light. That's the undiffracted. The, 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 the side ones are your diffracted spots. So main point here that I want you to remember is when you think about diffraction, always think about the wave nature. Whenever you think about scattering, you think about the particle nature, right? Now we will we will try to understand this thing in detail what I talked about. We know that de Broglie's principle, right? Lambda is equal to h phi p. And your P is the momentum of a particle. Since your momentum, you know that P is equal to mv, right? This is your simple representation where you have given the momentum, you have given the momentum its formula mv. Now, electron. E V. So here is the V where you tell us as, as 100 kV, 100, 200 kV, or 300 kV, whatever is your energy here. It is given for the electron acceleration. It becomes equal to half mv squared. And you can simply, you know, put the value of V here, and you can get this value. Velocity of electron is simply this. And putting this velocity here, what you can get into lambda, this is your final lambda. So this formula, which simply comes from yeah, solving lambda is equal to h by mv and giving the entire energy to the kinetic energy of the electron is giving you this velocity and you get a relationship between your wavelength and the energy of your electron. This is the most important relationship because you can simply calculate the wavelength that you get by giving a particular energy. In an electron microscope, you can change the voltage of the electron, 100, 200, 300. And whatever energy you give, shorter would be the wavelength. And shorter would be the wavelength means I can resolve the matter more closely. Right? Now, here, this is, they have done for electron. And I don't, did not want to make this lecture very complicated. They have also, people have read for neutrons and light and everything. And they have tried to calculate the lambda. So lambda, for a particular V, so this is the formula for electron. You plug into this formula and you put V. You can calculate it for different microscopy, uh, different microscopes we have. And what do you see here? For 100 kV microscope, you have you can you have 3.88, right? These are the final answer. From 200 kV, you have 2.74 picometer. So according to the formula, we can resolve into picometer. 
your, your mark. But can we do it? Where's the limitation? The limitation is in the objective lens of the microscope that we use. It cannot it doesn't have a resolution or magnification that it can resolve a matter of 2 picometer. That's why we are limited to nanometer. I think if we are able to design better lenses, we are able to do it. But again, as we talked in the class, 300 keV microscope would also mean a lot of damage to your material, right? So, as we also talked about, higher is the energy here, you will have a relativistic effect associated to it. So the realistic number, so this is uh, was the formula that we get it in, into the classical frame. Now higher energy such as 200 kV, there is a relativistic component attached to it. Therefore, your uh, values become from 3.88 to 3.70, 2.74 to 2.51, and 2.24 to 1.96. These are the final values, but still, you are not even looking at these values. You are looking at even finer values. You are going up to 0.1 nanometer because you are limited by the microscope. So this is what uh, is there. The resolution of the electron microscope is theoretically unlimited. We get the resolution which is 0.1 nanometer due to the objective lens. So today it's a little bit all details. We don't we don't have much images to show you, I don't, it will come in the next class, but today is the general working of the electrons. So, this is the scale that we remember. If I give you an image at 10,000 times and you look at the scale, and the scale is one centimeter, I keep in my mind one micrometer. This is a direct conversion. If I give you a micro, uh, an image at 50,000, right, and you look at the scale there, any images that even I give it to you, Sydney and Julie, if you look at the image, and you see the scale, if one centimeter is equal to 200 nanometer, you can directly tell me that this was the magnification that your image was taken. These are the direct numbers that you should keep in mind. Right. Now we talk about electron sources, right? So electron sources, what are the source characteristics? Like any other source, it will have brightness, it will have a temporal coherency. Can anyone elaborate what is temporal coherency? temporal the uh, like not every electron is exactly at 200 kV and there's some yes. spread in the energy that they're emitted at yes. there's a delta E associated to it so all the emitted electrons they have they are coherent with delta E right now with the source type the famous source type anyone can read this could be a theoretical question in your exam what are the most common source type in any electron microscope? It would be thermoionic, Sharkey field emission, and cold field emission. It is simply the type of sources that are connected on the top of microscope that are giving you the electrons. And that definitely changes the quality of your microscope. Because each of them has a particular temporal coherency as we talked about. They have different brightness required for different applications. Now, how do electron guns work? They work by principle thermionic or field emission. We'll, we'll come to that. And how do you measure gun properties? You measure the gun properties by beam current. How much electron per second? 
And what just happened? What is the biggest problem in the microscope? There's a beam that is coming. It doesn't converge. Why is the convergence important? Can you guess that? In a microscope, you need a very convergent beam. You don't need a very spread out beam for certain applications. Not for all. It determines your resolution. It's good for resolution. One thing. And, for example, if you have a sample like this, and there is a particular defect that you are looking at, which is very uh, localized, you want a very converged beam. And for that, some of the microscopes don't have converged beams. So what is the problem there? We need to put apertures to make it converge. So all these sources, they have different convergence angles, you know, they have different beam diameters, and they will have different energy spread, and they will have different spatial coherency. Now, for a source uh, characteristics, do anyone know which source we have in, in Giant? What is the microscope source? Is it a FEG? So anyone can ask if it's a FEG or thermoionic. These are the two common types. Tomorrow God meets you, he asks you, do you know which source we have? Is it FEG or thermoionic? Most likely FEG. This is the most common sources we use. Okay, source has different characteristics. What is the brightness? So brightness is current density per unit solid angle. Then is the current density. It's electron per unit area, per unit time. Now, there are different properties of the electron beam. And once I take you there on the lab, I can ask you to change the brightness. Once you change the brightness, that means you are changing the current density. Right? Then there would be other properties that you can change and play with. Is the beam diameter, your cathode emission current, and semi angle of divergence? Looks very, very simple uh, explanations, right? This is a very uh, simple explanation of the source that they give. They give you a filament which I will be covering in the next slide. Then there is an anode here. For large part they are applying some current or some voltage. Some voltage is applied, so the current is produced and the filament is emitting some electrons. And here is the emission current here. And this is your alpha knot which is a semi angle of divergence from source. And now this is the source which is on the top that you would see in the microscope. Mm -hmm. And after that, in the, in the tunnel, we have different lenses. So this is something you really don't control, but you can still control for higher applications. Any questions on this diagram? Simply a diagram of the source. I'm just trying to tell you how electrons are emitted in an electron microscope. These are not uh, very boring details, but this helps you to frame your thoughts that this is principally happening. Is that, sorry, just on that figure, is one L, is that the pole piece that that's pointing to? Or which one is that? On the left side where it says one L or one L? Yes. This is government and bias. This is all our pole pieces, right? Filament. Now your brightness, you can calculate like this, where your D naught was a beam diameter, your alpha naught was your, this angle, and I is your current, right? So this is how you calculate your brightness actually. It is your current density is coming, it is depending on this angle alpha and the gun cross crossover, which is, you know, small diameter here when the gun comes. You, you measure it because they consider it as a small circular point. And you can calculate the brightness. And they have calculated the brightness, so it's, the unit of brightness is ampere per meter square into steridian because it is, an angle, it is present in an angular form. And for different uh, uh, sources, the brightness is uh, like this. For cold effect, it is the highest. And it is right now, if, I don't know, we don't have gap in, um, in 
with the thermoionic kind of sources. The higher brightness is of fact Location groups. Amorphization. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What else could you think of? If I just you know send you what different things you can observe? Brain boundaries. Brain boundaries. Dislocation loops. Loops and lines, they are different. Anything else? Twin boundaries. Uh, brain boundaries? Uh, twin boundaries. Twin boundaries? Right. So we we many, right? Stacking falls, twin boundaries, grain boundaries, bubbles, cavity, 